Johnson's Chapel family. We are so, so excited to be able to be with you live today and uh, just are excited to be able to worship with you this morning. So if you, uh, if you wouldn't mind singing along with us, we're going to do our first song, and it's going to be Redeemed. Good morning, church. Uh, we'd like to remind you that you can continue to worship the Lord through giving uh, by going to the Johnston Chapel website, johnstonchapel.org, and you can give through that, that means. Or you can also um, give by sending your offering in through the mail. So remember those ways to give, and let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you today, and we thank you for the opportunity to, to gather together as the body of Christ uh, through the technology that you have blessed us with. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to, to worship you in spirit and truth, regardless of our circumstances. And Lord, today as we remember uh, Palm Sunday and those things, we, we repeat uh, what the crowds did in Matthew 21, 21 9, as the, the crowds went ahead of him and they shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Lord, we thank you that you sent your son, that he came and that he went to the cross and he paid the price for our sins. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day and defeated sin and death so that we can have eternal life with you by placing our faith in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross for us. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to, to worship you today. And Lord, we want to lift up different prayer requests to you. We think of the Richardsons. Lord, we pray that you would just continue to be with those and their family that are recovering from being sick, what was most likely the coronavirus. Continue to strengthen them, encourage them. Lord, we also pray that you'd be with their church family there in France as a former member uh, passed away from the coronavirus. Give them comfort and encouragement during this time. Lord, we also think of our missionaries, Eddie Wong. Continue to be with him and strengthen him and encourage him as he continues to heal uh, from his sickness, Lord. Lord, we also think of uh, Braden White, who had two seizures last night, that you'd just strengthen and encourage and help him during this time. Lord, we also pray for those that were planning on having surgeries, but that have now been uh, delayed because of everything going on. Lord, we ask that in the right time, uh, that they'd be able to have these surgeries and that they would go well. And Lord, we pray for those that are continuing to battle cancer during this time, that you'd strengthen and encourage them. And Lord, we do pray for... Uh, our family is at home. As everybody's at home with their family, uh, Lord, I ask that you'd help us to draw close to you um, in our families, that we'd seek after you and that we would uh, seek to encourage and build one another up. And Lord, we pray for our time of worship today, that you'd be honored and glorified as we, we pray and as we sing, as we give and as we hear from your word. 
Lord, may we go out and seek to live in obedience to your word throughout this week. Lord, we just thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Lord, we continue to pray for our shut-ins, Lord, for those that are not able to get out, that we look for opportunities to serve and to love them. And Lord, during this time of, of dealing with everything that's going on, may you give us the opportunity to share the gospel, to reach out with love to those around us. Lord, we praise you, we thank you, we give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This song that we're getting ready to sing is just replayed over and over and over in my mind because it talks about how no matter what, no matter what situation, your fear does not stand a chance in the arms of God. So let's sing together. Roll over my bones And sorrow comes to steal the joy I have And brokenness and pain is all I know No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I chance when I stand in your love. When shame no longer has a place to hide, I am not captive to the eyes. No, I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. No, I won't no, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love.
Great to be together, have the opportunity to worship, have the opportunity to dive into God's Word together this morning. President Theodore Roosevelt adopted a proverb that describes the importance of a strong military. He said, speak softly and carry a big stick. Now he elaborated by saying, if a man continually blusters, a big stick will not save him from trouble, and neither will speaking softly avail if back of the softness, there does not lie power. Now Roosevelt was speaking in terms of foreign policy, but actually I think that's a pretty good definition, a pretty good description of meekness. Meekness is a quiet confidence. It's not weakness, it is power under control. You see, behind the child of God lies the power of God. Meekness is spiritual fruit that is produced in us by an infinitely powerful God. So today we're going to continue on in the life of David, a man after God's own heart. And I I hope that we will understand and apply this important truth. God blesses those who demonstrate power under control. God blesses those who demonstrate power under control. We're going to be in 2 Samuel chapters 1-5. through We'll cover a lot of ground this morning. But it's in these chapters that David demonstrates for us a heart of meekness in the various seasons of life. As we move through the narrative, I want you to keep this in mind. This is actually a story that points to David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's begin with meekness and suffering. 
meekness and the season of suffering. We've been anticipating David's rise to kingship since 1 Samuel chapter 16, when Samuel, or when the Lord said to Samuel, Anoint David. This is the one. Now David is about 30 years old in our narrative. Psalm 78 gives us a picture, a picture of, uh, of his life and his kingship in the last three verses. He chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people Jacob, of Israel his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands he led them. So David was chosen to be king at 17 years of age, as just a young shepherd boy. And he would spend the next 12 years of his life running as a fugitive from his enemy Saul. But now the time has come. We've reached the pinnacle of the story. David will be king, and David will shepherd his people Israel with integrity of heart for the next 40 years. 2 Samuel opens up with David hearing the news of Saul's death. In the battle against the Philistines on Mount Gilboa, Saul was killed there along with his three sons, including Jonathan, David's best friend. Saul was critically wounded by archers in that battle, and as the Philistines were closing in, he didn't want them to capture him, so Saul fell on his own sword and took his life there. When the Philistines later found him, they cut off his head. They removed his armor and they put it in one of the temples of their goddesses. And then they fastened his body to the city wall. What a terrible and and sad and tragic end for Israel's first king. The news of Saul's death reaches David through a young Amalekite man who actually claims that he mercifully killed Saul as the Philistines were bearing down on him. Now it seems this is a fabricated story when we look back at 1 Samuel and chapter 31. He's making up this story to gain favor in the eyes of David. More likely, the young man was the first to find Saul dead, and then he removed his crown, he removed his armband, and he brought them to David. Notice David's response here in the text, 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 11. His response to the news of the death of of Saul. Then David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. Now most would expect David to rejoice here. Saul has ruined his life. Saul has been chasing him and opposing him and and trying to kill him for 12 years now. Now his enemy is dead. But David displays a a genuine mourning, a genuine grief. He he tears his clothes and he, he weeps and he fasts until evening. True meekness. David displays a true meekness. There is no gloating. No gloating over the death of his enemy Saul. Just humble and patient endurance of suffering. What meekness we see in the life of David. This is how Paul urges Christians to respond in Colossians 3 and verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness. There's our word meekness. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Notice what David does next in our text. Chapter 1 and verse 14. David asked him, Why were you not afraid to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called one of his men and said, Go, strike him down. So he struck him down and he died. For David had said to him, Your blood be on your own head. Your own mouth testified against you when you said, I killed the Lord's anointed. You know, two times during his life, David refused to lift a hand against the Lord's anointed. He held the position of king, that position of king of Israel in very high regard. David will not condone the killing 
of the Lord's anointed. So he has this young Amalekite man struck down. Now I bet that's not the response this young man was expecting. He came to gain David's favor and now he finds himself dead. But David's driving passion, it's not about politics. David's driving passion is the glory of God. And David writes a eulogy. He writes it in the form of a poem called The Song of the Bow. I want to share just a few lines from that poem found here in our text. Look at 2 Samuel 1 and verse 19. Your glory, O Israel, lies slain on your heights. How the mighty have fallen. Look down at verse 23. Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and gracious, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned you with garments and ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. So David laments. He laments the death of Saul and the death of his friend Jonathan. And he orders that all the people be taught this very song. David is loyal to the end. He speaks only words of grace and kindness about Saul. And he honors the Lord's anointed in his death. David demonstrates a heart of meekness in suffering. Second, David demonstrates a heart of meekness in the season of seeking. Let's consider meekness and seeking. Cartoonist Hank Ketchum once said, Flattery is like chewing gum. Enjoy it, but don't swallow it. Man, that is so true. David, uh, the first king of Israel, is dead. The people of Judah are looking to David to lead them. And David could have immediately assumed the throne and demanded a following. He could have swallowed the gum. But for the past 12 years, David has has, uh, been broken. David has been humbled. David has learned to lead with wisdom. David has experienced the empowerment of the Spirit of God. And most importantly, David has learned the importance of seeking the will of God. That's exactly what it means to be a man or to be a woman after God's own heart. Look with me at chapter 2 and verse 1. In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah, he asked. The Lord said, Go up. David asked, where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. So David went up there with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David also took the men who were with him, each with his own family, and they settled in Hebron and its towns. Then the men of Judah came to Hebron, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. David doesn't rush to the throne. No, David patiently waits for a word from the Lord and and the the Lord gives him direction to go to the southern region of Judah. And then the Lord affirms a specific location and that location is the town of Hebron. Hebron was a very strategic place. It was uh, one of the highest elevations in the region located about 20 miles south of Jerusalem. David and his men settle there and David begins to rule and reign over Judah, and that will last seven and a half years. Because not all of the tribes of Israel are united under David's leadership yet. What does David do? He waits on the Lord. There's no complaining. There's no anxiousness, no frustration from David. He just waits on the Lord to unite the entire kingdom under his leadership. He is going to simply obey the will of God for this day. No, the the meek person is teachable. That's the instruction that James gives us in James chapter 1 and verse 21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. If you want to be obedient to God's will for you this day, Get the wax out of your ears. What do you mean, get the wax out of your ears? If you look at the text there, that Greek word translated moral filth was sometimes used of earwax. It speaks of sin that that blocks our spiritual hearing. 
So what God desires is that we confess our sins to Him and that we humbly accept His inspired Word. This includes acting. Acting upon what we hear. Doing what the Word of God says. This is how we can accomplish the will of God for us today. So David demonstrates a heart of meekness in the seasons of suffering and seeking. Third, let's consider meekness and striving. Meekness and striving. Uh, David's role as king will not be without opposition. You see, Abner, who was Saul's cousin and the commander of Saul's army, he will not fall under David's leadership. He will not follow him as king. What he does is he quickly finds Saul's only remaining son, Ishbosheth, and he makes him king over the northern tribes of Israel. And that marks the beginning of a long war, a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. The northern kingdom, it was a weak kingdom led by a weak king with the support and backing of a very strong military leader named Abner. What a contrast there is between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Southern kingdom had a strong king. David, it was a strong kingdom, and it was backed by the power and greatness of Yahweh, the God of Israel. That was the strength of that kingdom. David continues to humbly wait on the Lord during this time of war. And in time, Abner decides to break, to break away from, to part ways with Ishbosheth. And he wants to join David and bring all of Israel under his rule. Notice what Abner says about David in chapter 3 and verse 17. Abner conferred with the elders of Israel and said, For some time you have wanted to make David your king. Now do it. For the Lord promised David, By my servant David I will rescue my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Notice Abner calls David the Lord's servant. David is referred to as the Lord's servant 30 times in the Old Testament. Abner has finally recognized the will of God for David is to assume the throne over Israel. I read the story of an African student named Sam who was uh, very excited to enroll at Taylor University in Indiana. And when he arrived on campus, the president of the university came and got him and took him on a tour of the entire campus, including all of the dorms. And then when that tour was over, he asked this young man, Sam, where would you like to live? Listen to Sam's response. If there is a room that no one wants, give that room to me. That caused the president to turn away in tears. You see, he had given thousands of tours of campus and never once had he received such a request. If there is a room that no one wants... Give that room to me. That's a servant. That's the heart of a servant. That is the meekness that Jesus describes in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. If there's a job that no one wants to do, I'll do that job. If there's a hardship that someone has to endure, I'll take that hardship. If there's a sacrifice someone needs to make, I'll make that sacrifice. That is the heart of a servant. That is meekness. Sam was a servant. David was a servant. What about you? Could that term servant be rightly applied to you? Could it be rightly joined with your name? Even though Abner here, the general of Saul's army, affirms his allegiance to David, Joab's not believing it. Now, Joab was David's general, the general of David's army. He's not buying it. He thinks that Abner is a spy. He's acting as a spy, trying to take David's life. So Joab, if you go back in the story, his brother was killed by Abner. So uh, Abner uh, is, is coming in and, and connecting with David here. And Joab is very, very concerned. And he waits for that opportune time where he can exact revenge on Abner. And he does it. He stabs him in the stomach and takes his life. 
You might expect again, David would rejoice. Abner is Saul's general. Abner was part of all that pursuit and opposition of David for those 12 years. You'd think he would be rejoicing. But David is angry. David is angry with Joab and he pronounces a curse on the household of Joab. And then look at how he responds to Abner's death here. Chapter 3 and verse 32. They buried Abner in Hebron and the king wept aloud at Abner's tomb. All the people wept also. The king sang this lament for Abner. Should Abner have died as the lawless die? Your hands were not bound. Your feet were not fettered. You fell as one falls before wicked men. And all the people wept over him again. Then they all came and urged David to eat something while it was still day. But David took an oath saying, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I taste bread or anything else before sunset. Again, a heart of meekness from David. He mourns and he weeps and he fasts. There is no ill word spoken about the man who caused him so much grief for the last 12 years. He honors Abner in his death. And sadly in our story, this isn't the end of the killing. Quite a bloody story here. Ishbosheth is now murdered by two of his own soldiers. Ishbosheth is in his own room sleeping, and, and these two men sneak in and take his life. They cut off his head and they bring it to David, thinking that they will earn David's favor by doing such a thing. But again, David doesn't do power politics. Look at his response in chapter 4 and verse 9. David answered Rechab and his brother Bana, the sons of Remon, the Berethite. As surely as the Lord lives, who has delivered me out of all trouble, when a man told me Saul is dead and thought he was bringing me good news, I seized him and put him to death in Ziklag. That was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more then, when wicked men have killed an innocent man in his own house and on his own bed, should I not now demand his blood from your hand and rid the earth of you? David calls Ishbosheth an innocent man and he orders the execution of the two men who took his life. David is not going to condone coming to power in this manner. But it's amazing in, in all of this, the good and the evil, God is superintending all the events and he is going to bring David to the throne of all Israel. The last remaining obstacle has been removed. Ishbosheth is now dead. David demonstrates a heart of meekness in the seasons of suffering and seeking and striving. Finally, let's consider meekness and shepherding. Meekness and shepherding. The moment has finally arrived. The pinnacle of the story. David is anointed king. Look with me over at chapter 5 and verse 1. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, you will be my shepherd, or you will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King, had come to king David at Hebron, the king made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed king David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king. And he reigned 40 years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. Three times we read that word all. In verse 1, in verse 3, and also in verse 5. The Lord has brought all of Israel under David's leadership. This is now a unified monarchy. The elders agree to submit to David's rule here. Why? Three reasons. David is family. David has proven himself as a mighty warrior. And they recognize that David is the true anointed king over all Israel. In verse 2 we see that first shepherd imagery used to describe the rule of David. David then makes Jerusalem the capital city of his kingdom. Look down with me at uh, verse 6 in 2 Samuel 5. 
the king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, You will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought, David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. On that day, David said, Anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and lame will not enter the palace. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons and they built a palace for David. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. This was a very important victory for David and his men because it dislodged a foreign nation that had settled right between the northern tribes and the southern tribes. Jerusalem was an elevated city. It was defensible from three sides. It was very strategically located. It was uh, right in the middle of a bunch of different trade routes. And it was the perfect location for the capital city. David builds a a palace there and he became more and more powerful. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Helen Rosevere uh, was a missionary in Africa. She was the only doctor at a very large hospital there. She was constantly dealing with interruptions and shortages and she was becoming increasingly frustrated, increasingly irritable with the people around her. So one of the African pastors who saw that in her life asked her to come on over to his humble home. When she arrived, he used his bare toe and he drew a long straight line in the dusty ground. He said, that is the problem, Helen. There is too much I in your service. So he gave her a suggestion. I've noticed that quite often you take a coffee break. And you hold that hot coffee in your hands, waiting for it to cool. Then he drew another line across the first one. Helen, from now on, as the coffee cools, ask God to cross out the eye and make you more like him. In the dust of that African ground where a cross had formed, Helen learned the valuable lesson of servant leadership. No, Helen is not the hero. David is not the hero. There is only one true hero in this universe, in the history of the world, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the true hero. David is going to rule. He will rule as the ideal anointed one. But David is only pointing forward. He's only pointing forward to his greater son, Jesus. Today is Palm Sunday. This is the day where we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. It marks the beginning of the Passion Week of Jesus Christ, where ultimately He will suffer and die and rise again to provide forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Do you remember how Jesus entered into Jerusalem on that day? Well, Zechariah gives us a description of it in Zechariah 9 and verse 9. Rejoice greatly! Daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, there's our word meek, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That day Jesus was announcing to the people of Israel, I am your messianic king. And he comes into Jerusalem gently and humbly and meekly, riding on a borrowed donkey. The people knew exactly what was happening. They removed their cloaks and they spread them out on the ground. Then they cut palm fronds and they placed them on the road. This was an act of reverence for royalty. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying. And they cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. They cry out, and give praises to Jesus. 
Jesus starts to approach Jerusalem and when he sees the city, he begins to weep loudly. He knows that all this praise is empty and shallow and superficial. He knows that all the people want is an earthly Messiah. They want a political king, but the reason he has come is to seek and to save that which was lost. And they missed it. They missed the whole reason for his coming. He was offering himself to them, but they would not accept him. And he knew the results of their rejection of him as Messiah. He knew in just a few short days their cries of, Hosanna, Hosanna, will be changed into cries of, Crucify Him. Crucify Him. Jesus. He is our perfect example of meekness. David was meek and suffering. So was his greater son, Jesus. Look at these words of 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23 with me. When they hurled their insults at Jesus, He did not retaliate. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. You know, when Jesus did open his mouth from the cross, the only words he spoke were words of love and grace and compassion. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. David was meek and seeking. So was his greater son, Jesus Consider his blood, sweat, and tears in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew chapter 26. Going a little farther, farther, Jesus fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. David was meek and striving. So was his greater son, Jesus The writer of Hebrews makes this declaration, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. So Jesus there, striving for his people, for his children. And finally, David was meek in shepherding. And so was his greater son, Jesus. Listen to Jesus' own words, John Chapter 10 and verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Because of Jesus' death for his sheep, God has exalted him to the highest place. And God has given him a name that is above every name. And that name is Lord. Jesus is Lord. In all of this display of of meekness, Don't forget that Jesus is coming again. And when Jesus comes again at His second coming, He will come in mighty power. That time, in the future, He will come riding on a white horse as judge and king. He will set up a a kingdom of righteousness, an earthly kingdom, for a thousand years. And then He will make all things new, as described in Revelation chapter 1. And verse 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. We can enjoy unhindered fellowship for all eternity with our great God because of the meekness of David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus this morning? Have you trusted in his perfect death as your substitute where he took your place and paid the penalty of your sin? Do you believe that he rose again In a perfect resurrection, Jesus is offering you rest. He is offering you eternal rest. Listen to his words in Matthew 11 and verse 28. Come to me, Jesus says, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, 
and you will find rest for your souls. That rest, that eternal rest that Jesus is talking about is rest from the burden of sin. It is rest from from trying to earn your way to God, trying to be perfect, trying to do something you could never do, which is to fulfill the law perfectly. Jesus was perfect for you. The Bible says it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. In meekness, Jesus came. He left the glories of heaven, took on human flesh, suffered and died in your place on the cross of Calvary, then rose again in a perfect resurrection. He did all of that in meekness so that you could have eternal rest. And He says, come to Me. I hope you'll come to Jesus today. In closing, God blesses those who demonstrate power under control. David demonstrates for us meekness in all the various seasons of life, in suffering, in seeking, in striving, and in shepherding. But this story is not really about David. This story is all about Jesus. Jesus is King. Jesus is the eternal King. And this week, may our hearts cry out, Blessed is the King of Israel. Blessed is the King of Israel. And may our actions mirror the cry of our hearts, Blessed is the King of Israel. Church, let's pray together. Father, thank You for Your Word that it is alive and it's powerful, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, and it penetrates right to the heart. Father, I ask that you'll do only what you can do by the work of your Spirit, which is to convict sinners, draw them to yourself, and miraculously and gloriously save them. Father, I pray for your church, that uh, that we would bless your name, that we would bless the name of your Son, Jesus the King of the universe. Help us to humble ourselves. Help us to display meekness. Help us to give ourselves as living sacrifices to the One who rules and reigns over all things. Father, we we love You. We thank You. We thank You that You are so trustworthy. That You're sovereign over everything. Sovereign over disease. Sovereign over kings and kingdoms. Sovereign over all things. And we look to You for help in these days. We look to You for for opportunity. And we want to glorify Your name in all things. We love You. We thank You for this time to, to gather in worship, to dig into Your Word. Please help it to bear fruit in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Uh, what the treasure it is to know what our Savior did. He so humbled Himself uh, because of His love for us so that we could know Him and have a relationship with Him. Thank you so much for that wonderful reminder, Pastor Dan. Uh, just a few uh, reminders for you this week. Uh, do remember that uh, all gatherings and events, activities that were scheduled for the month of April are canceled Uh, If there is any exceptions to that, it will be clearly noted. Uh, Remember that uh, you can connect with your youth, with Pastor James, on Thursday evenings, as well as with your children. Uh, There will be a Kids Club lesson that is uploaded to Facebook, our YouTube channel, uh, as well as on our church website. Uh, And you can also access that along with some supplement uh, tools uh, by contacting me directly for a private link. Um, We want to invite you to join us at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening for our GROW class. I would love to have you all gathered there. We're going to do that right here live on Facebook again at 7 p.m. this Wednesday evening. I'm sure many of you are wondering about Easter Sunday next week and how we're going to celebrate that. Uh, We are going to have a sunrise service. Uh, It will be posted on Facebook, again our YouTube channel our website, 
um, and that will be a special sunrise service, and that will be posted at 8 a.m. this Sunday morning. Along with that, we will be having our 1030 service, again, right here live on Facebook, and then, of course, that service will be posted on our church website and other platforms uh, following the live broadcast. Um, we are going to celebrate communion together and within our homes. So I want to remind you to have some elements ready so we can all participate together in celebrating the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection together. I want to uh, take just a moment as we close to read to you from the book of Romans, chapter 15. It says this, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go this week in one mind and let every utterance that we have bring glory and honor to our Father. Amen.